Hello. Uh, kitchen camera here. Oh. This is Gary's Harley Benton um, SC double cut, single cut, single cut, SC 450 I think it is. It's got a quality assurance sign. Ray has checked it and it's got some uh, got some paper covering the strings which I will snip off so this is yikes straight out of the box and you know this is the first impression that people say okay what's what's a Harley Benton like I don't know where this camera is pointing but we'll have to do so let's just plug it in um, and we'll go with kind of first impressions uh, socket is loose, not good. Harley Benton. Um, we'll have, a, have ourselves a sound. A clean, clean tone, please. So first impressions. Cat food in the way of everything. So first impressions. Uh, as you can see, pretty. Um, it's got coil tapping. And buckers. Um, oh, uh, I, well, I thought we had a crack on the neck joint. We don't. Um, this box was damaged, badly damaged. The outer box was badly damaged, but the inner box was safe, and the guitar was in good condition. Um, got very, very. We've actually got a very uh, acute bevel on this. Um, really, really, that much from the vertical sort of uh, 30 degrees so um, straight away we've got a highly high action let's get a ooh, 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 sharp something here uh, let's get a note so we're just on the first impression we're just kind of having a having a feel to see how the tuners work find any um, bad frets at this height it's so high up we just want to make sure everything works bend and every note to play cleanly which they appear to do um, but not too bad straight away the nut looks like it's been done as carefully as possible let's have a look the action not too bad um, problem is is by the time we take this down that's going to be even closer but we're going to find trouble as soon as we take it down okay so just initial impressions then handsome looking thing says anybody else in the world hates push pulls give me push push these are Roswell pickups the Harley Benton preferred 
thing. So actually it's all looking nice and tidy um, to start off with. A nice big chunky guitar. Pretty heavy, fairly heavy. That's quite barky, even uh, even on the cleanest channel. I have a feeling if we put that to a rectifier channel, that would be out of this world, really. <laughs> saddles which is quite common on these things I don't know why uh, it could be possible that they've actually got them back to front the wrong saddles on the wrong side depending on how they've cut the notches but maybe they're all the same size and it just looks odd on the thin strings but anyway um, yep so here we go for a full setup we're going to go with a we're gonna put a, a tusk adjustable nut in here we're going to go for a full setup new strings get it now playing nice and low um, and in doing so, we're going to discover uh, whether just whether these frets are even or not. I'm, I'm not massively thrilled by these incredibly slanted uh, frets. However, it's not so bad because um, the spacing and everything is fine. So there's they're not like you're running out of room or anything. Um, so it's, it's well proportioned. So you can afford to have such an oblique angle. Quite a big neck on it. Um, you know you're holding it, let's put it that way. Okay, so out to the shed we go. Hey, welcome back. It's, um, you're, where are you? You're hanging up on this thing here. Da -da. You mind, don't mind me, I'm nice and red from the sun, you know, lounging in the hammock as you do during lockdown. Anyway, here we have the Harley Benton SC 550, is it? Yeah, 550, I think, with the double coil taps down humbucker up single um, now this was very tall an action so if you remember I said it was about four millimeters it was a bit maybe a bit much <laughs> it's three it's, it's still still high which is over three but um, so what we're going to do is we're going to lower it first and just go down to a reasonable height and we're just going to see where we get and how it plays at a reasonable setting so down we go on both sides just willy-nilly so and this is just an initial thing what i've also done um, is i've just spent a little while making a couple of bases for adjustable bridges i've actually made these a sort of um the same color as the binding sort of snot color really you could call it but anyway these are these are freshly made so they're waiting to be reshaped but the nut is buried in there already you can see that so that's my next two nuts one for this guitar and one for a and other so the first step in this is going to be taking the original nut out but meantime wow <laughs> they've set the uh, pickup so high up that as soon as you lower the action you're going to crash into the strings so that's a that's a no-no so it's straight down now the thing about all of this for those of you of you it might be a new thing too this setup the real love guitar setup that i have developed over five years or more now is the whole point of it is it's designed so that or it's the aim is so that we can set the playing action that we want and then make the frets comply with that if you like it's a bit, bit of a, a harsh way of putting it, but so normally you have you get a guitar and it has as much as many uneven frets as it has or doesn't have, and your playing action that you can set is constrained primarily by the condition of the frets, usually, and also by the nut. So the nut and the condition of the frets stops you lowering the action to where most people uh, want it. And the simple fact is, without taking care of the underlying uneven frets um, you're, you're normally at the limit 
to where you can adjust the action down. So you'll find that most guitars will come out of the factory with the action set somewhere um, somewhere close to the limit that below which you'd find um, buzzing and choking and so on. And so underneath the the action that's been set, what you'll find is you'll find um, the uneven frets will cause buzzing and choking and it means that when you play notes up here they'll cut out because a very slightly uneven fret in front of that note will tend to uh, choke it out. So the idea with this setup is that we dictate the action and then we make the frets behave. Now I'm not saying that it's absolutely guaranteed that this guitar won't play at the action that I've set. Um, not bad. It won't stay in tune because it never will. The, the strings are always going to be um, out of tune. So first of all, let's have a look what we've got here. This is not bad for a Harley Benton, I've got to say. I'll be honest, um, when, they, when they get it really good, um, I'll be the first person to say it. That one's a little bit high still, so we'll go down a fraction on that. Um, but yeah, when they get it right, I'll, I'll definitely say it. Um, and if it doesn't need fret leveling, then fine, we'll, we'll take care of what needs taken care of only. Um, I think they've done a good job, actually. Better than I've seen for quite some time, I have to say. So that's, that's the limitation, but it's not bad. I mean, considering it's got a few slight sharp edges there, but so it's when we get down to the low, the lowest action, and this is pretty low, I must admit. We get this is where the slightly uneven frets come in, but I've got to be honest, I had to push that really low. Um, but what people like is that low action to begin with. Um, so we'll give them that, and that will require a very light bit of leveling, but not a lot. There's a fair bit of relief in there, so also we can flatten that a little bit. Um, and I'll do that before I take, uh, we remove the nut. So we'll just kind of come back, thank you. We'll just get the, the basic geometry done. Now the reason for swapping the nut out um, is to ensure that Gary has perfectly in tune uh, stability or tuning stability from here on outwards and also has the perfect first fret action <laughs> and the ability to change it later as well which is pretty good um, and that's why having done nut, cutting nuts and changing nuts for bone nuts and so on over a long period of time I'm actually totally convinced on the efficacy of using these um, uh, adjustable tusk nuts and they kind of aren't really designed for this kind of guitar they're designed for the Gibson Les Paul uh, certain year where they they made a special zero what they called I think they called it zero glide nut um, and uh, they, they made the two components for this nut in brass and because it was one component was a um, was a 
uh, one component was effectively a, a zero fret, but because it was made of brass, it notched incredibly quickly. In fact, it notched probably before the guitar even got to the owners. So that was unacceptable. It ended up with these horrible notches. And it's just a stupid mistake that brass is the worst possible material you can make a zero fret out of because it's so soft. You need stainless steel if you're going to use metal. Um, See, the, the other thing about this is it's not really a factory problem as such, but um, see how much slack is still available to pull off the strings. And this will keep, if you don't get the, this all out at the beginning when you start playing, it'll keep, it'll come out while you're playing. So the tuning stability, getting the tuning stability is about getting the nut right, but it's also about before this guitar leaves here, that all the stretch is, all the slack is going to be stretched out of the strings. Okay. Okay. So we've got a flat, flatter neck now, which will change the action very slightly. Um, we're just over one here, which is a bit ambitious. Um, we, we can afford to go to one and a half. That's the target action on our, our low strings. That's where I like to go, one and a half on the low strings and 1.2. Or if it's a really nice neck, one, as low as one on the uh, high strings. But that's that's really pushing it. So 1.2 is a good target, um, not too adventurous. And that is about there. Now that I had a an email from somebody far off the other day who thanked me for showing them the the power or the miracle of getting the nut right on a guitar, and you know it is one of those brilliant things when you discover it, and it's not rocket science, but you just most of us seem to take about forty years of playing to discover it. When you discover how important it is, it is like discovering gold or something and you just can't stop telling people get your nut slots right get your nut right um, so it's absolutely well worth investing in um, they haven't done a bad job here it's still a little higher than I would like but with the guitar all set up with a reasonably flat neck and by that I'm talking about about a tenth of a millimeter uh, relief um, we've got a 1.5 action uh, on the last fret low E, we've got about 1.2 on the high fret, low E, high E, low, last fret, high E, you know what I'm saying. Now on a lot of the guitars, you won't even get the notes playing, so this is actually a very good start, and I'm impressed, I have to say, to Harley Benton. I've had a lot in the past where the frets were just nowhere near as good as this. This is way better, but we have some choke, actually, yeah, a little bit of, that's not bad. Yeah, we got, there's one or two high frets and that's all, it's surprisingly good. And if you, if you didn't mind it a bit higher, you could get away with this at a, you know, straight out of the box playable action. Um, the only reason it's choking a little bit as we pushed it to the usual low action. And the only reason I do that, and, and lots of people comment about actions and they say, that's a ridiculous action, you know, how stupid to go. It, it's only, I only do it because that's what customers seem to like. Um, you know, some people say to me, should I start off learning with a high action? And the answer is yes and no. You know, if you, if you start learning with a high action, you'll get used to it and then you'll be able to play guitars with high actions. Um, when I was a kid, I had no choice because that's all there was. But um, the, the other point is, if you're uh, somebody who 
once has the option to set a guitar up the way they want it, which is why this is here, then um, why not have it at a low light action if that's what suits you and with a gauge of strings that you can bend a lot um, and and also with the first fret action that's light, nice and low too. So not only does it um, make it feel a lot easier to play down here when the action's really low, but it also um, prevents any notes down, played down here going sharp, which is which is a problem that uh, you get as soon as the nut slots go above about 0.5 in my experience. So that's why people like me to set the action low at this end, make the frets, just tweak the frets with fret leveling to make sure that they they can work with that low action and then to get the nut right in this case rather than stick with the original we're going to go with the tusk adjustable um, I don't have one here that's got it in it to show you but it's um it looks a little bit different from a regular uh, nut you know and to be fair Toman uh, Harley Benton have done a good job with this fitted nut whatever it's made of I can't tell with that scraping it probably plastic but it's not a bad nut for, for all of that um, but it, it you know to lower it to the the actions are slightly inconsistent on the strings and to get it down so for example we've got the E and the B aren't bad the G is too high the D is too high the A is too high and the E is quite low so you know to, to balance that all up nice and low to prevent any of those intonation or sharp fretted notes playing sharp issue we'd want to adjust it with nut files and if you adjust it with nut files truth is you 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 introduce raggedness in the slots so what I found in the past that using uh, one of these tusk adjustable nuts it's far better to have a nut where you can raise it and lower it to the exact action you want without disturbing the beautifully made factory slots because that's ideal to have the slots as they are but the problem is if you leave the slots as they are and in this case you're forced to accept the unevenness of the strings over the first fret. So the, the, the tusk nut is a great solution because it's, or the adjustable nut is a great solution because I can use the adjustability to bring the action to exactly where I want it and I can do so without touching the slots which is by far the best outcome even no matter how calm and, and uh, you know careful you are with your Japanese nut files. Oh we haven't got the light on here, sorry about that. Um, you know no matter how skillful you are with those they still leave a ragged slot and you sometimes have to find yourself widening it and so on with the sandpaper to get it right the tusk nut slots are just they're made in the factory you pay money for them you know and you get the factory precision so why not keep it and that's why bringing the action up to your perfect action is the way I like to go and that's why I recommend it and every customer I've ever put the, on the guitar they've never no one so far I, that, that I know has regretted it I think it's a very good um, 25 quid investment um, it would be great if uh, I could get these base parts made mass produced in a kind of hard plastic perhaps not quite as um, sepia uh, amber as that just a little bit lighter but you know if I could get a, a couple of hundred of these made on some 3d printer that would be brilliant but I don't know anyone with a 3d printer or how to um, apart from sending them there is no original if you see what I mean so somebody would have to make up an original to fit this unit so if you started with this unit and the idea of a minimum height and so on probably make probably design a, a base unit which I could then still needs to be fine-tuned with the sanding to get it to fit the particular guitar but anyway there you go so I'm very impressed with this so far um, so we're going to do every, the usual full thing on it but not because it's a terrible guitar actually because um, you know that's what Gary wants it to be, it to be as low and light as possible um, taking up the guitar later in life type of or coming back to the guitar you know um, and so there's no need to be fighting it so that's what we'll do and we'll also remove this nut and fit the um, adjustable nut now that's going to need to be worked for quite some time on the sanding block to get it down I've got the two of them here and I'll see which one works best or is quicker um, but part of the deal here is I've got they're sort of covered in covered yeah they've got what do you call it WD-40 on the unit itself so eventually it should be easy to take them out of these bits here but um, they, they continue to contract until they're completely inert so I might leave these a little while and come back to them uh, so there's no risk of them shrinking any further because you've got to have them they've got to be stable when you put the unit in or else it'll get stuck but it only takes a couple of hours or a few hours to be stable 
Okay, so that's the start point. We'll come back when it's time to knock the nut off, tailor the adjustable nut to fit, and then we'll go into the precision fret leveling after that. All right, and maybe we'll change the camera angle too. While I'm at it, um, for this section, I'll just give you a close up of what we've got here on the Harley Benton, just to give you a sort of sense of, if you haven't seen these guitars before, how they're put together. Dandruff, of course, uh, everywhere, little bits of dust on from packaging on the black poly finish. Nice bit of um, mother of pearl in there. Um, and there's our plastic, I think, nut. And I think it's been it's been cut by hand, so somebody's put some time into trying to get it right. So I think that's a great sign. I don't think it's just machine produced, but they've done some you know hard work. Um, but it's not quite right. But it's better than it used to be. So down we go to the um, Roswell. Now you can see here we've got the action nice and low now. Um, what about two two millimeters, two and a half? No, yeah, two millimeters lower than it was before. Um, uh, to be honest, it was set so high that I expected to find the frets in bad condition, but in this case it was just casually set high. Um, standard bridge, I don't know if you can see, but the, oh no way I, let's zoom you in a bit, the gaps here um, are quite big per these strings, so I don't know whether they're, they're all the right ones, those are kind of back to front, so the you can see how the the slot changes the way that string sits off the back of the, the intonation point is the back of the saddle there which is it works but it's not ideal um i really don't understand why the tunematic people ever did such a thing then we've got what what i really don't like so much which is the almost impossible to grasp things which you have to use a finger thumbnail for while you're playing and if you haven't got a thumbnail you're stuffed um, plasticky plastics, but actually a nice looking top. I um, don't know how they manufacture these, whether that's actually a piece of maple or whether it's a, you know, a photo thing, but uh, it's it's not a cheap one of the range, this. And there you can see we've got a nice, um, one of those nice contoured curves on the back. You can also hear there's a B in the shed. Um, slightly budgety on the strap lock, but effective. Um, I guess if you go a nicer um, type, you sort of start to dictate to people what kind of straps they use, right down to the, you know, do you put a shallow locking thing on as a standard, and then people have to use a shallow type string lock, strap lock, sorry. Um, yeah, nice looking thing, I mean, pretty. We've got sort of anonymous uh, tuners up there that seem to work okay. Um, I'm going to sneeze, but it's not a bad thing. I haven't got the disease, if you know what I mean. And then we've got the sort of much easier to use, but very non-classical um, hexagonal nut. You know, the, the as you know from the old days, the nuts were always, um, what do you call it? Round, knurled, knurled? Yeah, round with stripes, bits, <laughs> ridges, round with ridges. Anyway, so, but of course that's really difficult and you have to have a little tool for it. and. And they come undone, so you actually you can get a standard to change it. And on these Chinese made guitars, it's much more common to find hexagonal nut on there. And so there we've got the Roswell pickups, which seem to be fine, you know, they're nothing to complain about. And generally speaking, um, the condition of the, the frets here, and how well we can see them in the light, the fret condition isn't bad. You can see a couple of the ends are lifting there, um, but they're a little bit sharp and I, I yeah they are a bit sharp actually so that's that's that is a bit of just a little bit of uh lifting up which is causing it sharp but i'll soften those all off as we go um like i say a slightly hand finished nut nicely fitted and all that so they've done some made some effort to get it right but it doesn't doesn't have consistent string heights um, and there's no real logic to why it's the way it is. I suppose while we're here, let's have a show you if we're doing a quick tour. Um, and this actually is a good short video. Sorry about that, fingers in the way. A good short video for, um, why can't I see what I'm doing? It's because my fingers are immediately in the way. Oh. 
Well, for this bit of the video, we'll just have a quick look inside the back cover. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Um, oh, yeah, remember, loose jack socket. And that's a, that's a sort of a killer, really, because as soon as that moves a bit, if you're a newcomer, you know, and you've just got the guitar, a couple of weeks of going out and playing with your friends and the band and whatever, that, that'll just cut out because movement and electrics just don't go together, as you probably well know. So it's not a good, a good starting point. Um, mm -hmm. Just <laughs> look through the screen to see what I'm doing. Okay, so you expect to find in here, I would expect to find non-shielded, um, which is a shame really because if you remember, like, this is going down to single coils at certain parts. So, uh, yeah, non-shielded. Quite a busy little arrangement in here. Um, and it's got quick connect thingies going on. Um, yep, 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 yep. Full size pots, which is quite cool um, for a Chinese, relatively inexpensive guitar. Um, yeah, but no shielding. So this is operating as a single coil at certain points in the in the game. So you might think of shielding that and of course the inside of this plate. And uh, you know, if, if we were doing more work on it, like pick up swap, swaps or anything, I, this kind of thing I would do. Um, however, in this circumstance, uh, I'm not gonna pull the whole electrics apart to do that. Anyway, look, I'm going to put these on using two hands it's a much better idea okay see you in a bit verily it is time to continue why is that sticking there okay yeah so off camera some hard work making the base for this little fella nearly done actually um tiny bit of sanding still left to do methinks um let's just get that done it's just a little a little overhang of material. <sighs> Very difficult to get it right to the edge. It's not far off. And then <clears throat> you can just feel just a little tiny lip right there. So I'm gonna hope that this just flattens it out. It takes quite a long time to get this <coughs> right to uh, where you want it. It isn't quite there yet. A little bit of a uh, lip. That's very close. Very, but not completely. is a tiny little ledge lip. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take that back down a little edge on there because <clears throat> it just gets in the way. Doesn't do us any good. Put that in there again. And we are very close. So this is a, a sort of basic shaping of the um, the base unit that I do without really reference to the guitar in question. So the specifics of fitting it to this guitar happen in a minute, but we know we're starting from a pretty good universal fit to begin with. I know it's not gonna be any smaller than that. Okay, a little bit more flattening. There we are, nigh on perfect. 
Okay, so that's going to end up going there, as you can imagine. <clears throat> so, first I'm going to do is slack these off. Now, there's an interesting little situation where in a video a while back somebody said, I would never let you touch my guitars because their point of view was when I was fret levelling I would drop the strings off the side there like this. Um, often slightly under tension if it was the low E and the high E but the person was so uptight about it and I thought about it I thought well I've never seen the slightest bit of damage done to any guitar from that process. <coughs> Excuse me. But for fun I thought well there you go and now the string can touch on that. Hopefully it won't get in the way of removing the nut, but God, I can't turn these tuners, they're very stiff. Now the thing about the um, adjustable nut is that it just requires a bit of thinking when you uh, install it or when you change strings, for example. I'm just going to gently loosen that and remove it nicely barely fitted now this is a it's a hard plastic they may say new bone I'm not sure but anyway so the purpose of this is or the point of this whole thing now is to fit this to the uh, I have gone and got the sticky I have got I have got the strings caught on this here. So I'm just going to move this out of the way so I can actually get a clear run at the slot. Okay, so the idea is we're going to fit this um, nut to this end slot here. And of course, if it's, if it's too wide on the base, then we have to do a little bit of adjustment still. And right now it is, and you could probably you could probably do a measurement to see. <coughs> set to zero so we've got a gap here of 5.7 5.7 and if we look at the bottom of here that will be 6.3 6.3 so we've got a bit of reduction to do there still and I've got to eyeball this now and see where it's going to come from and I can see it fairly clearly so I'm going to take it down by hand this is a little bit clumsy because it's it's not like a big board where I can guarantee it won't move so these small ones are cute but not as effective <coughs> as going for one of these so we said 5.7 and I'm going to take it down from the edge here so I am wearing this down with a sort of consistent movement because I want to end up with the same thickness all the way and it's actually much easier to move your body than it is to move your arms because it changes the angle on the, or the, the uh, pressure on the what's it that thing nut so taking it down with body movements <coughs> is a useful way to do it you involve your legs and your Upper ter terso, terso. Now this is a bit mucky, this sandpaper, and I haven't got any more. So it, it may slightly discolour the um, front edge of this, but that's not the end of the world. Okay, so we're going to get a situation where it's going to pop into there <coughs> quite neat neatly and that's the hope. I'll just do a little bit of reduction on this side as well. And then we'll <coughs> excuse me, a frog in the throat today. More than usual. Now we've got 614, 605, so we're getting there. Um, and then we'll take a bit more from this side. I'm going to have to order a load more of this 
sandpaper. I, I do use it up at a fair old rate. Okay. It's sort of leaving a, a, a messy stripe down the um, down the nut because it's mucky. So I'm going to just try and <coughs> clean it up really with this slightly nicer looking sandpaper. Okay, so we're getting them to the right thickness. Um, and then we sort of just tip it in there and it's now just about on the verge of fitting. And there's, it's, it's always, a, it's never a perfect fit. There's always a bit of a lip on the front edge where the paint sometimes comes off if you take the nut away. That's underneath the um, cover, but it's, it's, you know, it's always worth worth checking it in case it needs a dab of paint later on just to tidy it up. Okay, so that's <coughs> just looking to finish this to the perfect. Now that's going to get us the front and back size, right? That's the, that's the important bit. So it'll fit in this slot neatly, which at the moment it's still a little big. Now I don't want to cut this slot at all. Um, I want to work the nut, not the slot. I actually have ordered a cool looking tool. It's um, a Hosca nut slot file, which is a solid lump of metal designed to cut, give you a square cut um, <coughs> in the nut slot, but uh, it's not here. Anyway, but it's quite a difficult thing to do. It's got a little a couple of holes in here. It's like a, a Swiss cheese. Okay, so the idea is we just get in there and that just starting to fit in. And it's chipping just because it's such a tight fit. It's chipping the edge of the paint there. So we'll be prepared in case we need to tidy it up. But it is a very, very precise thing. But it's not impossible to get there, it just takes time. Now the next thing after this, once we've got this width sorted, and the fact that we should get this pretty much dropping neatly into there now, that's very close to being, <coughs> being on the mark. Once we get it in fitting that way, then the next challenge will be the height. And I've always said, the aim of these nuts is to start with uh, the, the screws fully out. We don't want them doing any work to begin with. So we make sure that they're all the way out and the nut is fully down inside or in the unit. And what we want is we want to put the strings back on and start with the strings on the first fret. Um, once we've got that, oh, hellfire, I've just dismantled the thing. Hold on. Sorry about this. What have I done? This isn't very clever. Let's just try and attach that again. Hopefully that isn't going to... It might come pinging out any second now. Oh, um, <coughs> stay. Uh, yes, so the idea is we want this low enough so that these strings sit on the first fret to begin with and then we want to use, the idea is to obviously use the screws to raise and lower the nut to the per perfect place we want it. Now you may be able to see straight away that this is um, just about the right thickness and it actually might not be that far off but we can always tell by retrieving, that's good, that's on the mark actually, we might not have to go any further down. So there we go. We're pretty much starting where we want it, um, which is strings on the deck. It may be a little high on the treble end. Oh no, oh no, that's not too bad. Let's just push that into place. <coughs> okay, that's pretty good. Oh, there it goes. Got a little tiny hex key. So each one of these custom thingies comes with its own hex key, naturally. Um, let's get this safely out of the way. Let's put it somewhere 
like this. I don't want it anywhere near the guitar, really. I'll put that out of the way. <coughs> okay, so spacing. Okay, let's tighten it up a little bit. That's dead on the thing. <coughs> Now this will obviously push the nut down into place and get it seated. Now the difference, the only slight difference between this and the original nut actually is the original nut's got, got an, surprisingly, slightly narrower spacing, um, which we'll see how this works. If it's no go then we might have to revert to a standard tusk nut, but um, I don't really want to do that because that defeats the whole object. Okay, so the first thing to say is this is fitted smoothly and snugly in place, fit-wise. Um, we might take off a little bit of the width of the whole piece. Um, actually, by the looks of it, from the uh, from the treble side, if anything overhanging in there a little bit <clears throat> okay so the first thing aim we're going to do is to raise up the nut give me the action I want and you can see that the, the grub screws then sort of sink neatly down um, this is a little taller at this end by definition so it's not going in as far but it's not really worth changing it for now this was the only reason I didn't like the way these sl uh, frets were slanted is what they've done is they've taken away the um, taken away the width. These are tens, so we're going to do the fret leveling. Sorry, I've got the camera in the wrong place. <coughs> These are tens, so we're going to do the fret leveling uh, with tens, but we will switch to nines when we're doing the setup. Well, sorry, when we're restringing. But the only impact that will have is just on the amount of relief which we can adjust for. So there we have a, <coughs> how a nut, very low action, a um, little bit of Dremel work to tidy up on this end, just take the excess off. Um, a, I have to say a fraction closer to the edge of the fret so that, than I would have liked, but I have to say that comes down to the unusually low angle they've, uh, they've done these frets at. But having just played it through there, <coughs> it, it's fine, it's not getting, it's not... Um, falling off the board and there's more room as you get down here but it's just a it's just a strange uh, that's a, a nice spacing but the angle is really really it's you know it's, it's 30 degrees or maybe even less it's not it's not what I would do <clears throat> but it's a factory decision for some reason um, and I, I, you know it does work with this particular nut um, and it's Overall, it's about I would say it's about a millimeter difference in spacing, um, 
which is it's, it's pronounced on this one. It's not the case on most um, most of the Harley Benton. So maybe they've changed something in the size or the spacing they're working to. But that's a slight new one. Um, so the only question is, does it work? Um, because if not, then we'd we'd have to revert to a standard nut if that were the case. Okay. all going good and that feels good sounds good we'll leave those strings there because we'll need to flip them on and off not strings we'll leave the tape there what I'm going to do now is I'm going to prep the there you go here comes the tape saving the day um, so here I'm going to just prepare the frets for precision fret leveling and the aim of this will be to just free up the notes for this nice low action. So remember I said right at the beginning, this is about you choosing the action you want and making the guitar work to that, as opposed to the other way around, which is um, pretty much the way that we've always been forced to have it all our lives as players, or as youngsters, when we're youngsters, we, we, we work with whatever the action the guitar permits us to have and you, know, you remember from your first guitars it's it's never very high at all uh, sorry never very low at all it's always um, raised up to uh, overcome any uneven frets but like I said earlier that these are in pretty good condition very su pleasantly surprised at the state of the frets on here but there are some little buzzes and chokes and um, now this is, you know, if you take the thing off under tension, the, the chap who was complaining about it, the thing goes slack anyway when you take it off the uh, out of the nut. So I don't really see. I think the worry. I think some people get a, a worry in their head about something, and then it becomes a kind of significant. You know, they they, they kind of know better, and and they're you know it's understandably if they're worried it becomes a a thing. Interestingly, the frets down here are steeper. They, they've they've made them very slanted at the neck end for some reason. I don't know whether they think that will make it less uncomfortable or more comfortable. Who knows? But anyway. Um, okay, so we have the strings under tension and we'll get on with the fret levelling. have a choice of two, two uh, truss rods that I use regularly. Um, it's uh, interesting that in, this might be due some new, in fact this probably is due some new uh, tape, tape, double sided sticky stuff. I'll use this one, this has got fresher stuff on it, but it also doesn't go completely flat, which is okay. And we probably get get away with it. Um, yeah, the, I noticed um, in my ebook, one of the recommendations, or a recommendation I made was that this uh, should be, or it would be good to start with a 46 centimeter truss rod. Well, in fact, over the years, it's become clear to me that, uh, a slightly shorter one seems to work better. So I now caveat that and um, change the recommendation to anything from 42 to 46, but maybe starting out shorter to begin with. Okay, so good old method, 
gravity assisted pretty much and we're just going to run the uh, truss rod up and down. It's configured or calibrated to this curve already and we're going to just get an indication of where it's removing any material. At this stage I can always get a good sense of whether the uh, frets have been leveled in the factory or not because if they have they tend not to recrown them and they, they very often show up with flat spots on them and I'm thinking that might be what's happening here um, in, in other words the, the spots show up as flat much faster than um, I could have made flattened them so a little pass like that with a 400 grit wouldn't make a big flat spot unless it's been done before individual notes playing nicely. What I don't know about that is whether the bends now are going to be great. So um, I'm going to move on to the B track and the B track I do at the same calibration as the E track. Um, do a little bit of leveling and this, of course if it's a short 42 centimeter rod you have to kind of move backwards and forwards a little bit and you can hear it it'll clunk onto that fret but it doesn't do it any harm it just it just knocks against it until it rides over it um, and then we get the B track done and again it's it's not touching down here now so we had some high ends and now we're touching in here on the B track now this is where it was choking out a, a note in the middle and that's kind of explaining it some a little cluster of high frets there but you know I'm being I'm being hypercritical um, as you know because I'm setting a very low action for a customer who wants that. Very good. A tiny little, I'll do a little fraction more up there. Um, one of the things I took me a long time to discover was that more than I was more likely on a fret level to wimp out <coughs> than to overdo. Um, and one of the things that I, I learned or have learned over the years of doing this is that for a newcomer to this method, um, it, it can feel very scary. So a lot of people back off as soon as they see the thing, the tool cutting into the metal, they, it feels like you, you know, you're ruining your beautiful set of frets. So that can be very scary um, so from based on my own experience of it um, I, I tend to advise to just to be aware that you're likely to feel like you've done more damage than you have damage as in done, done more work than you have um, and and so I um, and some customers' guitars who want it really low and accurate. You know, it's quite often the case that I've stopped before I should have done because I'm just nervous about going too far. And treat fret metal as the sort of holy grail of the thing. You know, fret metal is the life of the guitar. Um, <clears throat> so, in, in for example, JT, some of his guitars are a good example of taking them to a certain point and then done them a second time later on and gone that extra bit that I didn't have the nerve to do the first time round. And a good way of um, comparing this is if, if I think, if I ever get to thinking I'm doing a lot of damage to the fret metal here, is to go and watch somebody on YouTube talking about or doing a fret level. And I saw a guy the other day and he got, um, you know, as we've all done, he got, uh, oh, I don't know where it is now, but he got uh, a big block of wood, a bit like, um, like one of the spirit levels and it was at least that wide on the base and he stuck tape to it and he just went <laughs> up and down and took an absolute ton of material off but didn't think anything of it every single fret was scraped considerably um, and <clears throat> that was the you know the fret leveling done um, so I, I sometimes go and watch one of those to just remind me that this even when I think this is going heavy it's a very, very light method. Um, I haven't got a close-up here, but uh, it'd be good to show you. So what we've got, originally I had a couple of 
um, choke outs happening right up here but actually the one that bothered me most was one or two down here and this is showing me that these three frets are high relative to the other ones and that one too so there is a, a kind of cluster of frets there's still some relief in the neck so it shouldn't be it's not the neck it's not a back bow in the neck but it's definitely a little cluster there and what I'm pretty confident is um, having done those three tracks now not only will the G play all the notes cleanly but also we'll get that's where it was that was choking out it's, it's a fraction more I'm going to do there so it's cleared the note but it's still I can still hear that tiny little protest now this is a very very low action so a really um, I'm not complaining. It was these frets were pretty good to begin with, and they're very, very good now. Um, <clears throat> and to expect them to do any more than that is really asking a lot. But since we're there and we can, now th this whole business of, of choking, when you have slightly uneven frets. What happens is he might play all the notes nicely so it means that <clears throat> the frets relative to one another going up down here are good or even but what happens is as you bend across you sometimes find that as this string goes across into what I call the G track the middle um, you find it chokes out there and that's a, a, a challenge or a mixture of the, the the dynamics or the geometry you're doing here you're pushing a string from a low point up a hill effectively up the fret to the middle and then it's coming back down to a low point down here and it then has to clear any imperfections in this fret and as you go up that hill and the discrepancy between the hill and the bottom becomes greater the clearance because it's going the string is anchored further down here the clearance down here uh, across here is, is absolutely tiny and that's where you'll very quickly find chokes when you're doing on low actions big bends here And that's pretty good. I'm going to do one more tiny bit in that G track up the very top. <coughs> now I say I do it up the top, I'm doing it in the same place, or I'm doing it all over. But what I'm sort of doing is concentrating a little bit, <coughs> a little bit more on the top. Now it's, you could say it's sort of cheating. It's not using the tool universally away, all the way across. And that's true. And it's just one of the things you sort of learn to do out of experience. And so, there you go. Clear it up. So it's very, very subtle tweaks, um, but it's, you know, it's what people like, the precision of this. They enjoy being able to bend strings all the way up the top there and get um, one millimeter action at the moment on that side. So that's incredibly low. And, you know, I, I get it that people will make comments and say, that's far too low. Um, <clears throat> and for a lot of people it is, and that's absolutely fine and dandy. Um, it, but there's no point telling me that when customers want it <coughs> low and light. So you give the customer what they want. There isn't any set minimum height that a, a good guitar should be at. Some people like it a certain way and some people like it really, really low. And most owners of things like Ibanez guitars with their beautiful wizard necks, they, they, uh, they always they buy them because they want a very low, fast action. fraction more on that but before I do it I'm just going to double check the, um, the calibration as I call it just make sure that the, we've got the right thing yeah that's touching all three evenly so a fraction more um, concentrating on the second half of the neck and then we'll move on um, I can see some dust picking up but that's pretty normal um, this method there's, there's all manner of reasons why I've continued to use this method of 
leveling. These these are definitely high. These three these three frets, but and those two as well actually. But you know, relatively speaking, they were pretty good, so I'm not complaining about them. Um, yeah, there, there are a number of advantages of doing fret leveling this way, which are over five years or so of doing it have have um, you know basically proved themselves to me such that I wouldn't do it any other way. Um, not the least of which is the fact that you we're using this method you only have to level and um, until you've freed up the uh, the notes at the action you've got the guitar tuned in for so you never just keep on going so with, with the um with the radius block no radius block, yeah with the radius block or the um the beam method the fret rocker somebody goes oh look i've got uneven frets and they go scrapey scrape all the way up and down that method, you keep going basically until you've either, well, first of all, you go until you scrape the tops of all the frets. <clears throat> That's a standard thing. And then you keep going until you can discern no tapping, no rocking. Um, the point is you've gone for an, a, a, an absolute levelness, which, which you don't actually need. That's the point. So you've, you've almost certainly taken off more material than you need. You only need it level enough to, to play the action you've set. So you don't need it any more than that. Um, so to, to keep on keep on leveling um, is is costly in fret metal. And as the great thing about this method is because the strings are on here, um, I can do a bit of leveling. I can start by hearing the, the chokes. I can level until they disappear, and then I can stop. So I don't do any more than is absolutely necessary. And that's that's probably its single greatest. Um, aspect or the greatest advantage of this me method preservation of fret metal um, another one is a sort of it's a kind of not coincidental but it's a it's a nice to have it's a bonus I suppose and that is that when um, when your, your guitar is fully strung um, it's not only under load in terms of the fact that it's pulling the neck into a, into a curve but it's also compressed longitudinally, and some people go to great lengths to buy jigs that that um, measure the amount of curvature on the neck when the, the guitar's uh, strung, and then they um, they kind of bend the neck that way using some push, uh, some plungers or whatever, um, and then they take the strings off and they do the leveling or whatever. But um, even when you, even if you replicate the curvature, it's it's it, because the strings aren't on it, it's not replicating the compression. And the compression adds some movement to where the frets sit, bizarrely. Good. Um, and, and so that, that uh, combination of curvature um, and the compression, uh, if you level with the compression at, you've dialed in if you like and in, in at play while you're leveling what you basically get is a relative levelness now which will change a bit when I take the strings off but when I load it back on with new strings those frets will all go back into um, the same relative levelness in relation to each other um, which includes the variation caused by the uh, the longitudinal compression and that isn't the case with the other methods so I'm pleased about that aspect too it's it's, it's not it's not it be, be all and end all but it's just a, a kind of bonus um, that you get with the method okay so having um, having now leveled the frets I can see you know it's taken a bit off some of them done some work on some and left some untouched so you clearly got some low spots but they're below the action that we've chosen so they're not a, a problem so the, the first thing I really need to do before we do any anything else is we need to fit this nut now when you're replacing strings uh, you want to undo the strings from the outside inwards otherwise the nut will have a tendency to ping out because this nut unit is this is a, so you've got a slightly bent uh, key there, a bent, bent shaft. Um, yeah, if, if you if you just go from one end, it will go flip. 
because it is by definition a free moving object. Um, it's not going to move. In fact, because it isn't going to move, I'm probably happier not even to glue it in. <laughs> um, there's no point gluing it in unless it's actually, oh, maybe it, maybe it will. Yeah, if it's a tiny bit of movement, then glue it in, which I'll do. But if, it, if it's really snug, then um, don't add fixatives where, where they're not strictly necessary, because it just makes one, more, adds one layer of difficulty getting the, uh, uh, getting it unpicked at some future point. Now, when you come to put it back on, you've got to be very um, clear about where it's going to sit. Um, now, I know that it's overhanging, and actually, I don't really what I don't want to be doing is trying to over cut it down in size while it's overhanging. So I think I'll try and um, just gently work this back while it's off, um, and I'll get myself as close as I can to the end of the nut um, in all dimensions. It's not exactly that easy to do by hand, but the alternative to doing this is to uh, find yourself working the end of the nut with a Dremel, which is a little bit a little bit harder to, well, not hard, but you have to be very, very careful when you're doing that. And the, it's next to the guitar, if you get what I mean. Um, while we're at it, um, I could also, at this point, just, just lower this end very small fraction um, since we're a little bit up at the treble end um, there's no harm in focusing a bit of attention on dropping that end down a little bit in keeping with everything else um, and then just make sure it's smooth all the way across <coughs> Um, yeah, making one of these yourself, you, you, it takes a bit of experience to know exactly how the uh, the top piece sits, so that you get it sitting at the right angle. Otherwise, you can get it go off off target a bit. Um, but once you've done it a few times, then it can be fairly easy. And I'm going to use a bit of paper as a holder for my glue, so I can basically pick it up and. Put it down in the slot. There's a blob there for some reason. I don't want much in there, just enough to hold it steady. Now the most important thing is when I put this back in, I want the I want the um, nut to sit in place quickly, and um, I don't want it to have to be pushed around. So first thing I'm going to do is get the strings into it, and I can feel that it's. It's, you know, to, if I can just get the string in, then I can see where it sits. Okay. Somewhere like that. And then I'll add some loading to the middle ones. Get it down. And then outwards. Get them in the right order. Yes, yeah, slightly bent that one. Be careful when winding. Now this is this is all I'm doing right here and now. It's just using the strings and the loading just to anchor the nut in place. I'm just be committing committing to it. Okay, that's good. I like it. I'm happy with that. And it's pretty flush on that side. Okay, so that's always a bit of a, a, a panicky moment getting that um, on because if you get it in the wrong place, you can get you can find yourself having to knock it off and do it again. Okay, so with that happily pegged in place, now we can remove these again side by side. Um, these strings, whoops, get it right. Um, <laughs> get it right, not like that. Um, these strings are useful for um, 
well they would have been if had it not broken them, it would have been useful as a sacrificial spare set. But as it is now they'll get chopped up and binned and we'll put on nines. Now because we're putting on nines the chances are that the pull on the neck is going to be, well it will be less poundage so the neck may flatten out a little bit more and we may need to dial in a little bit more relief. Also, get rid of this bit of paper. So, the point being is, having st stuck the base in, what we'll find is this top bit now will come out. At, at leisure so the base part is now permanent fixture and this should it pop out will always just drop back in there like that um, and it doesn't move from side to side so I'm gonna chop these off the bridge um, we can just put over here I'm just gonna double check the bridge close up the tunomatic bridge always comes with for some reason historical reason comes with Three, three of the saddles facing one direction and three facing the other. And when you come to intonate the strings, sometimes you are forced to turn some of them round to the opposite side to gain a bit of extra intonation travel spring. Oh, sorry, saddle travel, um, which is annoying that they even bothered making it that way round in the first place. So on this one, we have frankly all the slots are the same size that's what I wanted to know but the way they've designed it I wonder if I can draw this the way they've designed it is it sort of defies logic really because um, let's see what if I can do this let's see if I can turn this thing around hey stay there are you attached yeah okay so they have uh, what's the best way to draw this? How am I going to draw it? So they have they have a saddle like basically like this, okay? Saddle like this with a spring going through it, and inside the the saddle bit they have a a notch, and at the bottom of the notch the the surface runs like that. And the idea is the string would come up that little hill and launch off the front edge of the saddle and as a result of that you're not in the best position I know but as a result of that you would you would consider that your if you like your intonation point is not the right term but you know that's that's the, the bit where you start measuring from from there to the nut okay and that equals your scale length and the idea is if you need to lengthen it you just wander backwards Problem is, or well, the confusing part is on the same guitar, they have three of them are pointing that way, and in this case it's the treble three, and then they have the other three, just so happen to be uh, pointing that way, and this, this, this. So don't forget, in that we've got the uh, thing going like that, right? There's the little. Uh, the, the slope inside the, uh, the slot and of course the point is that the string is still has to come up here and it goes to there and jumps off the point there and, and you can see that on this one sorry you can't see it now but on this one the we're all still facing the nut at that end but the intonation point now is at the back end of the saddle and also what it means is whereas this takes the load along here that lies on the slope this is fresh air. All right. Why they do that? Tell me. It does the job because it's got a, a fulcrum point or a pivot point or whatever you want to call it. Um, still does the job and that one does too because it comes off as a clear launch point at the front end. But it often can lead people to think that the uh, setting is really confusing and odd because it makes it looks like this one's 
way further back or not far back enough but in fact you've got all of this distance back that it really is so it kind of you can have them all lined up and yet there's a huge difference between that front edge and the back edge um any music in the garden what's going on this is gonna fall off how am i sorry about this i'm just trying to get you locked in place securely Mm -hmm. My magic arm thing is a little bit clumsy. That sort of works. Yeah, right. Um, anyway, so, so this is currently set with three one way and three the other. Uh, we could take those three off. I don't think it's a major problem. They're always made this way. The only reason I'm going to mess with this is if I can't intonate it. Um, but we shall, we shall see. Um, it's not going to, that slope of business doesn't affect how it sounds or plays, but technically you would think it would, judging by, you know, the, this our whole idea of the slope and the string resting, the idea that the string should rest on the slope. Hey, hey. Okay, so I'm just going to wipe a bit of this dust off my hands. Um, and while I'm here, I'm going to brush off some of the... Um, a crude dust here. Falls to the floor, gets vacuumed up later. Now what we're going to do is we're going to reprofile the frets because I've crowned them. No, sorry, wrong word. I have flattened them. Now I'm going to uh, mark up the tops again and this is going to be a good guide to um, what I'm doing with the next file and then the problem with leveling frets is that you get them all to the same level but to do it you have to flatten some in relation to others so some some that weren't too the ones that weren't too high will stay mostly rounded the ones were too high will get flattened off a bit and that's absolutely fine but uh, they they start to get wider on top when they're flattened and so as a result they the, uh, the, the intonation point again starts to wander off into different places which you don't want. So what you need to do once you've leveled them and put a few flat spots on them is you need to re, uh, reprofile them or recrown them, reprofile, whatever I call it, reprofiling. Re so we're going to use this concave um, diamond file. I'm going to use that to re profile these frets into a nice uh, arch form and the black marker is very handy to allow me to see where the flat spots are and where I need to work this fret to get it nice and arch shaped and it gives me an idea when to stop because I want to leave a line, a thinnest possible line of black marker down the centre of the fret top because that will mean that I've reshaped it uh, as much as possible, but not uh, reduce the height any, which is the aim of it. If I reduce the height, then I'm changing what I've already achieved, which is a relative levelness. Now, I've got a little brass brush here that I use in between swipes with this file. It's getting older now, this Stumac file, and it sometimes clogs up earlier with this black marker sharpie marker so this keeps it easier for me to uh, just kind of declog it as I go along um, in between each fret and I have a, you know got more confidence that I'm, I'm getting the recrowning the way I want it okay so once I've done this then the next part of the process is to uh, mask off the fingerboard and just get ready to polish these frets out to a working finish. And that will be a combination of um, sandpaper and micro mesh pads at the end to give it a nice smooth playing finish. Um, it's a sort of combination of papers that I've used over many years and it seems to work pretty well. You can spend forever shining up your frets to you know a more than mirror finish but um, it can it can take a lot of time or you can spend a lot of time chasing glitter gold dust it's 
discard it. So the ones that have been flattened most I end up spending more time on, um, and that's an indication of where the you know where there was a higher spot than others. The ones I zip through quickly uh, are barely touched by the level up. Here you've got to be a little bit careful because you can fall off the board. Um, it's one of those things that you can if you're not confident and you but you you know you've got a good quality finish. Um, you won't necessarily want to do it with an old finish, but if you're confident that it's a new poly finish and it's tough, you can just protect it off. So if you hit there with, with your file, you won't do any harm. Um, the other thing is, if you do use this kind of file, um, it's not. I don't show how. To, I don't show this file in my ebook. I show a three-sided file not not because um you know I, i'll tell you you know tell people how to use one thing and then they use another it's simply because the ebook was aimed at showing how to do the setups with the most the most inexpensive tools possible whereas this file is about 100 pounds worth and the reason i use it is because i do hundreds of setups um and so the three three-sided file method takes about three times longer this isn't taking a huge amount of time, but you know when you do lots of setups, but you don't want to be doing you know, three times the amount of time for the sake of it. Um, but if you do use this kind of file, it's it's a very good way. This file will reveal to you how much or how little you've actually um, leveled the frets, because what can look like you know you've savaged them. Actually, when you come to use that file, you see they round off incredibly quickly, which tells you you didn't really take that much off in the first in the first place. Con you know, by contrast, if you have taken a load off, um, it will you'll also discover that in the same way. You know, it'll it'll take quite a while to work each fret back to a arch shape. Okay. So, you know, just to sort of summarise this again, this isn't this guitar was pretty good out of the box condition, and I could lower the frets and you could play it, and the only you could lower the action and play it and have a great time, and the only time you would possibly run into a problem would have been some big bends, and you might just find they would choke out. And to be honest, you'd probably raise your action a tiny bit and just get on with it and enjoy it. And so it's not a criticism of Harley Benton, um, the fact that I did this work. It's a, this is um, Gary spending a little bit of money on making this as fine and as precise as it can be um, for his first guitar. I don't know if it's first ever, but certainly first guitar in a long time guitar. So, you know, it's a, it's a kind of luxury uh, to himself, and why not? So, you know, it's not a criticism, and it's not a review of Harley Benton saying, oh, look, you have to do all this work to make it even playable. You don't. That was a, that was a good condition set of frets to begin with, an impressive condition. You know, and, and I have to say, it has improved, so it isn't... Uh, it isn't as if every Hardy Benton that's ever come this way has been that good, because they haven't. Okay, so now we have a complete set of uh, leveled, re-crowned, reprofiled frets that now just need to be po uh, polished out. And to do that, oh no, I'm running out of tape. To do that, we will use some of the last remaining masking tape that I possess. Um, and we will mask off this entire fingerboard. Now, obviously, to begin with, um, the tape will go on, and then we'll eventually need smaller pieces, so I'll end up having to cut a load of strips to allow me to go all the way down here, which I'll tend to do off camera, because it's boring. Um, I used to wrap the tape around the neck because it sort of held it in place. Sometimes when you're doing the sandpapering you can lift the tape off and then you have to cut some more and it's a pain. Um, but actually the, tr the rule of thumb is, is if you can avoid putting this as anywhere on lacquer or sorry finish 
avoid it touching finish wherever possible. It's just a good rule of thumb because once in a once in a blue moon you will you will come across some finish that's weak or even faulty, as I did with a, a an old Fender long not, uh, long time ago. I did set up a an old Fender uh, Tele. Was it? I think it was a Tele. No, it was a Strat with. Um, with a maple fingerboard and I just I put some low tack masking tape on across the top here and it lifted the whole lot off it just came away in big flakes so there is, there's definitely some finish that's dodgy or you know and it, it turned out that that era of uh, those particular strats were renowned for having completely um, flaky finish but it didn't help me much that I then had to concentrate on refinishing the fingerboard for the customer who obviously wouldn't necessarily expect that to happen but you know it's outside of my control you can't you can't polish frets like that without masking off the fingerboard when it comes to a maple neck like that anyway all right so i'm going to cut loads of strips cover it up and what i'm going to do is do i'll do the sanding off camera um, and we'll come back when it's time to restring and uh, we'll be stretching the strings out setting the nut finally and checking the intonation and setting it done oh, Jesus. <laughs> sorry about that i'll have to rework this <laughs> um i'm just going to um i'm going to um i'm going to attach you to here safely that will be safe anyway all right Whew. try and avoid the bright lights so you don't get dazzled Basil. Right, okay, so I am. Um, we are sanded, polished out, and I've cleaned the frets back and the fingerboard and everything. So it's now nearly time to oil it and restring it. But the first thing I want to do is to just tighten up this jack socket, which I sort of made a big deal about when I. Um, when I mentioned it on Facebook or wherever that place is. Oh, I've got turnability. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, some people go, oh, that's only a jack socket that's loose. Well, that's true, but if you're a youngster and this is your... Oh, yeah, I'll tell you what else is... This plate is on... It's... This is back to front. I don't really want to take this off, but it's it, it's back to front and or they've um they've countersunk the wrong side. They've been, so they're, they're inside out curves. This is not brilliant. Um, I'm just going to see if it's reversible to, to improve it, uh, or if it's going to have to stay there back to front I'm afraid I have a feeling that may be the case um, yeah there's a little detail I, anyway people thought I was being a bit unkind a bit critical of uh, yeah it is countersunk on the wrong side it's slightly it's either back to front or it's completely flat when it needs to be curved but okay that's fine I just I wanted to check it's not brilliant it looks a bit sticky out even anyway um, yeah, so it's so a risk of sounding hypercritical about the jack socket being loose. Um, if it's you or me, then you know we kind of know what to do with it, and that's fine. But if you're this is your if this were your you're a youngster and this was your first guitar, then of all the things that's going to bring your enjoyment to a halt, um, a duff jack plug is going to be one of them because. Uh, as you know, if it moves, you know, if, if you've got ele electrics that move, then they're going to trash and break. Um, so it, they don't go together, movement and wiring. And it's, it is the quickest way to sort of knackering the, uh, the electrics. Um, and that's a sort of, you know, a bit of disappointment down the road for somebody with their new guitar. So it's not, it's just not ideal. And you don't, you really don't want to be in that territory um, anyway just a point you know as, as I always say movement and 
jack sockets or movement of wiring do not go together very well. And if you're a young rock star, you're going to be leaping all over the place. And so it's going to give up the ghost fairly soon. Yeah, that's that's not a very cool jack plate, but that's what they've given you, I'm afraid. Um, so put this in, uh, turn it backwards, kind of holds it in a locking position, and then we just tighten up. There we go. And hopefully that's going to give it a bit more, a bit of durability which this is what we really want. Okay, so that was just one small detail. Um, so I just think, you know, it is, it's a small thing, that, it's a little detail that they've got wrong. And, you know, I know people who would be so annoyed at that if it if it came loose and started crackling or whatever, that it, it would be so annoying that, I don't know, there you are, they'd send it back. And, you know, Toman would have to deal with uh, you know, return and all the hassle and selling it as a second or whatever they do with it um, after that. So it just seems counterproductive and for the sake of getting that little detail right. Anyway, so I'm just now going to put some oil onto this fingerboard. I've forgotten it had a funny name, didn't it? Um, I can't remember. A cool little name, but it's, it's, it's nicer material than tech wood, I have to say. It's sort of, it's a nice light rosewood substitute. I mean, some people miss the really dark Brazilian rosewood type stuff or Caribbean rosewood, Honduran rosewood, is it? Oh, that's mahogany. No, what's the rosewood there? The, the really dark stuff. Oh, anyway. Um, but yeah, sort of, some people really like that more than anything. But this isn't a bad color. Um, feels nice as well, so. Okay, a bit of oil. And then we can replace the nut. Seat it, oh, let's get it the right way around, shall we Samuel? Yep, the right way around. Fat edge facing forwards, so it slopes upwards. Silly me. Okay, so um, oil on there, nice. Um, stop bar back on bridge back on same way as it was facing before we'll uh, we'll worry about accessing the screws for intonation um, I kind of assume that for a start that it's going to be quite good but we never know so here we go with our Ernie Ball 9s and um, so the secret of tuning stability I've found over the years is twofold or 50 50. Half of it is in your the quality of your nut slots. Okay, um, the nuts slots will grip your strings without you even knowing it. Um, if you get if you get uh, train your ear, you'll you'll start to recognize it as it's a feel and a sound. The feel is that you can tune and nothing happens. The sound is that you'll hear the strings pinging in the slot when they overcome the... Oh, I'm going the wrong way through this. I'm thinking I'm going wrap around bridge. Oh. Um, you'll hear it ping when the tension overcomes the resistance and it jumps forward. Um, but either way, it, it will hold a differential pressure either side of the nut. And uh, that will come out when you're playing when you least need it to. And it will spoil your playing and spoil your experience of playing. So getting the nut slots smooth and and uh, cut right but also at the exact right height is critical to the sort of stable tuning at this end. And the other half of it, but along with the nut slots, is stretching the slack out of new strings. And a lot of people think the quick stretch they do before they as they put their new strings on at home is enough. And it is if that's kind of the tuning stability you expect then a quick uh, a quick stretch and the way you play and it goes in what seems to be in tune and, and you're away and it's great fun and all the rest but 
it'll it'll sort of leach out that unreleased slack as you play and in conjunction with the nut slots it'll continue to do that for a long time and I've I've had people bring guitars that have been strung for a couple of years um, and, and they still are going out of tune when I pull the string now you, you in simple terms well, let's start from the middle that's a, a little note here Gary if we're stringing the uh, adjustable bridge we go with the the D and the uh, G first and that will hold the nut in place so whatever else you do it's not going to come pinging off so pull all the way through taut and pull back a fret's worth and then wind on and I like to hold let the loose string the free bit go underneath the held string so I around and then hook it upwards and then push the or direct the held string underneath the loose string on the second time round and then let it pick up the slag and that's going to hold the nut in place and especially if we do the same now with the G. Um, yeah so if the thing is if you don't if you don't get one half of this tuning stable tuning equation done you'll never you'll never discover the, the power of the other half if you see what I mean because even if only only one half is not taken care of. Like for example, let's say you stretched your strings for half an hour, but your nut slots were terrible. Well, you'll never know the effect that stretching your string has because you'll still be going out of tune because of your nut slots. So either half not done properly results in a kind of horrible experience, tuning experience. Get both done properly and you will stay in tune for hours be in tune when you pick it up and it'll stay in tune and that for me is why I pick up a guitar versus another one you know pick up one guitar over another one um, and it's funny that over the years when you when you're younger younger it often is you go for the, the super superficial things first you know the brand names top of your list um, whoops followed by um, you know the look of the thing the shape and so on and then followed by the, the pickups it's got in it and, and so on and so on and so on until um, finally last on your list is how the action is to play and whether or not it stays in tune tends to be last on the list because um, you don't really understand when you're younger that that's the pr pretty much the most important thing of all that is, anyway the whole point is that I've discovered that that priority listing uh, gets completely turned on its head the older you get um, so that everything you thought was important the exact opposite is true by the time you're in your 40s or 50s and the reason you'll pick up one guitar over all the others is because it it's um it stays and plays in tune whereas the others don't even if it's a, a budget guitar and it doesn't oh hang on this one uh, which way am i going first come on samuel under over this one first thank you um, yeah, you know, you'll end up, if you've got the tuning stable, you'll end up going for your Squire above your, you know, Fender Custom Shop anytime if the Squire stays and plays in tune. That is a bent, you have got a bent tuner there, I'm afraid. It's not going to spoil the playing, but it's just, it's just part of the quality control course, I'm afraid. It works, but it's, when you're using a, a string winder like that it just feels a little bit odd but it doesn't look bad and there's no this doesn't spoil the experience of the guitar okay um, so yeah this thing about the tuning get get the stretching right and get the nut right and that's why I recommend this tusk adjustable nut because it gives you the things you need from a nut which is perfect um, friction free slots the best in the business I'm afraid um, and it gives you an, a perfect first fret action which is also critical to the um, tuning st stability of when you fret notes near the nut but also um, it's critical to the feel of the guitar anyway um, so you get those two things right and you have a very different guitar um, and you know there's some some sort of myths that have to be put to sleep a little bit put to bed um, you know when you look at tuning so for example some people will always think that the tuners you have on your guitar are implicated in its tuning stability well they're not 
there's almost no tuner I've ever, in fact I don't think I've ever come across a tuner that actually um, goes out of tune. What happens is you, your tuners will give you more or less of a smooth, lint, you know, nice smooth notch free, nicely geared experience, but they won't go in or out of tune. Um, the tuning stability is entirely down to the quality of the slots and the uh, slack in the strings. And that's, a, that's quite a revelation that I learned. And you know, I couldn't quite really figure out how I didn't know that after 30 years of playing, but or it took me so long to figure it out. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is, and I'm just gonna give these a, a sort of seating tug on here. And I've also, in the sanding of and polishing of the frets. I've also done the edges too, so taking away the sharp edges. This feels really good actually. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm carefully stretching these strings because I want to stretch them, but I really don't can't afford the risk of breaking them. So I'm going to have to be extremely careful. So the first thing I want to do is get me a sort of basic tuning. and tune everything else up. Make sure the nut's seated correctly. Yep. It's harder to use that tuner. Okay, so here's what I do for tuning stability. I get hold of the string and I push between thumbs and four fingers. Now some people have seen this, I learned this from someone else, but some people see this and they get on comments and criticize it and think it's absolutely ridiculous that you should have to treat your strings like this. Well, do it this way once and stick with it and then see if you ever don't do it this way again. Because once you've, once you've got this down and you see how stable your tuning is because you know you've got this bit taken care of now and the remaining bit the, the remaining enemy of tuning stability is only the slack in these strings and once you've got this taken care of you're going to be convinced and you're not going to go backwards now I'm being very gentle because I, I really don't want to um have I lost the no it's still oh no I think I've taken the plastic off that one now Okay, that came off when I took the paper off. But the one on the back still has it on. Oh well. Okay, so we see what the detune is. So we do that again. And then we do the whole thing again, working our way up and down the strings, the thumb and forefinger, and even into here if we can, without breaking the string, we've just got to be very careful. It's going to be, it's usually, almost certainly going to be the high E that breaks in this process. I recommend that you do three or four of these thumb and forefinger up and downs, and, oh, I didn't want to do that, um, three or four of them. And basically, you're going to be going until... There's no more detuning um, when you stretch the strings. And that once you've got to that point, you've got tuning stability, which means you can bend notes to your heart's content and you get no, little or no detuning when that happens. So while it's detuning still, Still settling. Still settling whether it's on the posts or in the in the stock bar or it's the string itself stretching a bit. Now I think I've lowered this. These pegs have got moved. So what I'm going to do just now before I do any more stretching is I'm just going to double treble check the um, action at this end. Just make sure it's where it was before. 
only slightly out, but because these posts get moved while you're doing different things. Okay, it's nice and low. That is very low. So I'm also risking these kinds of bends as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's very. You're seeing probably just a button blast of sunlight over there. Staying in tune now. A little bit of detuning. Now, because it's nines and not tens, I'm going to just double check the um, relief here, and it's very, very small, um, but it's actually, I think it's, yeah, it's just, probably needs just a fraction more relief, and it's just, just clattering a tiny bit. Um, so, I'm just going to get the Allen key, X key. Really, I want the other one. Where's it gone? Mm -hmm. It's vanished. Still. Okay, so I'm going to go in here and we want to, what do we want to do? Uh, slack it a little bit. That's what we want to do. My L shaped one's taking a walk. That is no good. Damn. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Staring me in the face, sorry. Okay, let's have a look. Yeah, nines don't load the neck very much at all, so. Just that tiny little. This is the final, but it tend to be the final stage of the stretching for me. And we are close to stable now. Still there. not to break the string. Um, yeah, it's, it's relief, some relief, not a, a ton. These definitely are slightly uneven, but you'd have to, it's not the, it's hard to show, it's not a, it's not the end of the world, but when you look across the, the spread of the strings, the G is standing a little bit higher than everything else, and it's a bit out of sequence, of the B is a, as well, or maybe it's the D that's low. One of the, there's something out of sequence there, and that's just the inaccuracy of the slots, unfortunately. Yeah. Now I have to get the tuner. Or 
although I'd say that's pretty much spot on. Let's just do it. Hold on. Okay, nearly there. So here we have our our tuna. I don't like this on less balls because you can't really well, you rest it on there a bit to test the intonation. Which I, I would prefer it didn't do that. Yeah, they've done it well. What, what you'll never hear when you've got a tusk nut like this in place, you'll never hear a ping. When you're tuning, you can be very confident. Now that's flat. This is where they've bloody gone wrong. It's a bit flat. What they've done here is this exactly what I feared is this is too close oh god don't make me have to take it off because they've got the way they've got this round this is actually uh, too long so it's it needs to be a little closer than this and that's true because the, the, the in reality the uh, I could do a little diagram it's, it really annoys me this okay this is so in 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 in, in unscientific right the typical pattern goes like this. If this was a straight line, right? Typical pattern, let's break it into six, shall we, or whatever it does. <sighs> For the sake of it, right. Typical pattern goes there, actually, um, yeah, there, there, for a plain G, and then the D steps forward of the G, and then goes back, and then goes back to low E, okay? Because of this stupidity of the putting these saddles around the wrong way, which means I'm now going to have to undo it, take it apart, and try and turn it around. What we've really got on this guitar, okay, which is causing the slight problem of the intonation being off and being impossible to correct, is that you've actually got at the moment this, this, and this, um, and then they've actually got it because of the way round it is. It goes like that, that, and that. So you can see that they, the, and I'll superimpose where it should be, there, there, and there. It's not so bad on those two, but it, it's here, they've got it wrong, and it's because of, they've set it according to how these things look. If you look at these saddles on their own, they appear to follow that correct thing, but because these are around the wrong way, and it pushes the intonation point right to the back of the damn thing, the actual pivot point is currently behind the one of the G and that as you can see it's supposed to be in front of the G and here in actual fact it's behind it which is what's wrong and that is because of this stupid tunematic blasted design which anyone who's watched my videos knows I can't stand it because now what it means having having gone through all the trouble of setting this up. I would like nothing more now than to be able to put this in a box, bag it up and get it back. Unfortunately now I can't do that. Now having stressed the strings out, okay, I'm now going to have to undo the strings from side to side so the nut doesn't ping off. All right now we're stressing the strings which means the likelihood that they're going to break now is increased. Okay, And I have to now take these off so far that I can actually get this bridge out. Right? And that's the stupid design of the bridge that forces me to do this. And I really, really, really resent that. Okay, so now we have to hoik this out. Again, probably stressing the strings a little bit. Okay, support that under there, lift those out. And now, I don't know 
whether or not this little these little uh, devices will come out. I haven't I haven't pulled these apart before, and I hate doing it because they're held by a weird little circlet that I'm going to have to study quite some time. And I can only go back in one way. Where is the shape of it? Ugh. Yuck. So the bottom line is I've, I've got to, well, I mean, I could try the simplest way around, which isn't going to work, is I could try and do an adjustment here that would put this in front of, but if I look at it, I could barely get that. That's almost, that's almost exactly in line with, um, it's a vain, a valiant attempt, but it's not good enough really. Um, I could just get it in line with, but no better. So if I, if I take this back down here and go extreme, I can probably, can I get it off without losing the whole circuit business? Oh yeah, I hope so. Can I please, please? Oh yeah, let's turn this one around. I'm pleased with that. I didn't want to lose the whole arrangement. Okay, so we don't want it that way, we want it the front way round. Now this one may well be all we need to do with the set. But it just goes to show how annoying it is. Put that back on. Hurrah. Okay, so now this one I know has got to be pulled in front of that one. This one needs to come back now because it's not as far back as it was too far back. And this one needs to come to there. So we've got a step, a reasonable step. Let's look at it. That's quite a big step. Jaden, next door neighbor. Okay, front, back, back. Okay, so now that looks a little odd because we've turned one round and it's still following the correct sequence. But that's more likely going to work. Now I don't want to do this more than once, I really don't, because like I said the stress this puts on the strings in all departments at this end, at the nut end and so on, is completely not what I want. Guess what love, you just come in time to hear me curse the damn tunematic bridge arrangement again. Oh, how exciting. How predictable. God I hate them. Thank you very much. Yes, I had to turn one of these around because it was in the room. There's no reason why they do this. It's just convention that mess, messes it up every time. So now I've had to, de I had to overstress the strings by slacking them off and going through the tightening up process again. What is that? That face. It's your fault. I don't hope I can do these up without it breaking because that's another set of strings if it does. Which gets expensive, especially since coronavirus has caused the strings to go up in price. They come from China. Uh, they come from people making extra money. Yeah, that too. Um. Yes. I need the doctor. My back. Something very wrong with it. Right now. Can't take an hour. No. Have to go tomorrow with whatever the arrangement is. Okay. Yes. Don't go, they say, but phone. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's your fault, flat face. Everything's your fault. Yeah. Oh. It's very oh. tidy in Are here. You on kidding? This bit, not that bit. Not really. That bit's just a. That's why the camera's pointing away that's from That's like it. the side of your bed. Shh. <laughs> I don't do work <laughs> inside my bed. Oh, oh look, in another mug. Shh, 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 shh. Yes. Just, just so happens. <laughs> oh, and there's another cat on the doorstep here. Coming in from out of the cold. <laughs> right. Now let's.
let's do the intonation again with our little correction factored in. <laughs> let's see, here we go. Yay. We are done. No thanks to Mr. Tuno Matic. Okay, um, I'm going to replace the Harley Benton thingamajig, truss rod, tress rod cover, um, and then after that, because it's um, the nut now is the same thickness as the original nut, so it will go back together nicely. we no problem putting this cover back on. The holes will all align as before. Um, and then, basically, uh, it's ready to go home. And uh, thanks, Gary, for um, getting it sent to me via Toman. And Toman, if you're watching, um, generally very impressed with the fret condition on this. Much better than some of the earlier ones that I have worked on. Um, but a few small mistakes and... The intonation was one, uh, the bent tuner arm is another one, just a little bit hard to work. I don't even know if you'd be able to see it's bent, but it is. Um, and shielding in these cavities in future, why not? Peanuts, right? It's going to operate as a single coil and then get a, get a curved plate. This looks horrible. It's just, it's just, uh, uh. all right, anyway, there we go, Harley Benton SC450 generally better than before um, with a few small niggles which it's a shame but there we go Ta -da! thanks for watching <laughs>